KRQE News 13 investigative reporter Ann Perrette is back here in the digital studio for discussion today about her latest investigation. Ann, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chris. You're welcome. Well, this is an interesting story. And if I'm just trying to summarize things here briefly, as, as I put it here kind of in my notes, this is the story of a family with a 10-year-old daughter who has significant medical issues and a state medical program that's supposed to sort of ensure that she's getting specialized care, but it's falling short. Is that about a correct summary of this situation here? Yes, so that is what this family of the 10-year-old um, and the Disability Rights New Mexico organization are alleging. And they actually filed a lawsuit as a result of this. There she is, 10-year-old Amariz, um, and you just saw her with her family there too. So they welcomed us into their home. We got the opportunity yeah. to meet them and kind of find out really what's going on. You mentioned that she has these significant medical issues. They are life-threatening disabilities. Um, you'll see her there. That was her in the hospital. Um, really difficult interview, very emotional interview. Um, she... Her parents kind of started noticing something around the age of two, and then they said there was a really big regression at age five. Wow. What they were just kind of paying attention to was like this low muscle tone, mm -hmm. um, and then it wasn't until she was seven years old that they got the official diagnosis, and that diagnosis being Rett syndrome, okay. which impacts your brain development, but also impacts um, your muscle tone as well. So that's kind of you know what they were noticing. That's eventually what they find out. Um, and then she also has autism, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy. Wow. So she needs eyes on her 24-7, which is where the lawsuit came in um, as a result of this medical waiver that she's supposed to be getting because she is considered medically fragile. Um, she should be having an in-home nurse helping to take care of her. Yeah. She's so cute. Um, yeah. And, yeah, that, that service is just not being provided. Wow. So there's, there's a, a lawsuit that's a component of this story here today because things have gotten sort of so tenuous, it sounds like, with the level of care that she's received. And, and we'll get a little bit more to that. Just to note, if you haven't watched this full story yet, we'll post a link to that in the page that you're seeing this here on carequee.com so you can get a chance to watch Anne's full story as well, her full investigation. Um, so as I understand it, though, you know, as you mentioned, she needs a lot of care. There's this medically fragile waiver program that the state has. But as the family is sort of saying, um, you know, this girl has really just gotten a fraction of the care, as I understand mm -hmm. it, that she should be receiving. Um, you talked about how in the story, uh, there's about 20 hours of care that has been provided by an in-home nurse help since 2020 or so. But just to kind of clarify the situation there, are they receiving any care at all? Or did that really just sort of stop in 2020? Yeah, so she is supposed to re be receiving 40 hours of an in-home nurse. So an in-home nurse should be with them for 40 hours a week. As of right now, she has zero, absolutely zero help. Okay. And the family said that those 20 hours you're referencing in 2020 only really happened um, for about a month or two. Okay. Granted, they really needed it at that time. Um, why Amariz needs it? eyes on her 24 seven is she will have these 30 minute clusters of seizures, this little girl, and it can be one to two, three times a day. It's every one to three days is what her mom told me. Mm. And when that happens, I mean, if she's eating, she needs to be taken out of those straps. She needs to be, you know, put in a certain position so that she's not choking. Yeah. When you have a seizure, you completely lose, you know, all bodily functions. Um, and so she needs that help. Yeah. In 2020, there was a point, a period her mom was telling me where she just, I mean, it was like, it, it was really bad. Mm. As of right now, it's 30 minute clusters every one to three days, but it was it, it was really bad at that point, and so they really did need that help. So it was great, <laughs> but yeah. they should be having 40 hours per week, um, and that's really what has put a strain, I mean, and, and what led them to taking legal action, because the uh, this family, so as a result of her needing 24-7 care, her mom ended up having to 
quit her job. Yes. Um, and yeah. she phrases it, not just her job, her career, all dreams of her career, because she has to stay home. She has to watch her daughter. Yeah. Um, you can imagine how everybody in that family is impacted. And one thing that really struck me was um, every night, she has to sleep with her hand on Amariz's stomach to make sure that she is or is not having a seizure because those seizures can happen at any point. Yeah. So just yeah. really scary, really sad um, situation. And of course, you know, when they find out, oh, she didn't need to quit her job, she should have a nurse there mm. um, helping to take care of her. And, you know, to her mom's not medically trained. She's not a nurse. So yeah. um, really just, just tough on this family. Yeah. So while it does seem like there's a lot of family really pitching in, um, it didn't come without sacrifice. And as you had mentioned, um, Amariz's mom's uh, job, she had to give that up to, to really ensure that her daughter had the care that she needed. But then there's the state program that really is not filling the gaps plays into the lawsuit, which we'll get to a little bit more of. But I want to just go back a little bit more to this medically fragile waiver program. Um, you mentioned to me in a conversation we had before this conversation, but that there is a way of calculating, right, how much help a family can receive. Um, it's not really discussed in the story, but this is a chance to kind of talk a little bit more about that here. How does that work? How is that number of in-home nursing hours that a child requires, how is that determined? Yeah, the 40 hours, it wasn't just a guess, right? So there is a whole assessment done, and I'm looking at my notes here to make sure I get this correct. So UNM, University of New Mexico, their Center for Development and Disability conducts what's called um, a comprehensive needs assessment and level of care determination. So it is experts who are evaluating this and seeing, okay, what are Amariz's needs or any of these other kids who are considered medically fragile who have these life-threatening disabilities what are their needs and in-home nursing is just one piece of that um, obviously a critical one when you're determining the number of hours of support um, and so that's kind of how they get to that then the actual insurance company has to agree to that and they you know there's a whole conversation here that happens so the insurance company is aware okay amadis needs 40 hours of in-home um, nursing services we have to provide that and I of see. course that's not being done so um, not just the state but the insurance companies who are supposed to be providing um, these actual, these, these nurses in these homes are also being sued by these families. Yeah. Is the delay that's happening here just sort of a symptom of the pandemic and the change that we've seen in the landscape of nursing? Is that really the reason why they're not getting as much care as they need? Is just maybe that there's a staffing shortage and what can they do? You know, um, the state health department or I'm sorry, the state human services department did say that. The families say that's an easy cop out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, the uh, Disability Rights New Mexico organization who is bringing this lawsuit with these families said, you know, this has been going on prior to COVID. So it, it's a difficult determination to make, right? You can't, right. I don't think, just make it a blanket statement. But I think it's important to point out um, that I did speak with the Medicaid director, not about the lawsuit, you know, they cannot comment on, on pending litigation, but um, she said specific to nurses, there is a shortage. That's been the challenge, is making, is finding nurses to be in these homes to fulfill the those hours that are required. Mm. Um, she mentioned as a result of the pandemic, and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here to make sure I get this correct, it's the burnout mm. um, that nurses have experienced. Um, it's also the national nursing shortage that we have seen across this country. There are some perks when you're a traveling nurse, you get paid higher. Mm -hmm. So a lot of nurses are leaving New Mexico. Um, and then something she mentioned that I thought was really interesting is this desire to work in the hospital setting rather than an in-home setting. A big piece of that, she said, was during the pandemic, these nurses wanted to do the most good, which at that point was being in the hospital mm -hmm. because these hospitals were overwhelmed. You know seeing where they could provide the most help that was in in hospitals but 
families are saying, uh, you know, one reason for that too is that if you're in a hospital, you get paid better. Um, the Disability Rights New Mexico attorney that I spoke with said, you can get paid the same at a fast food restaurant as you could being an in-home nurse for somebody. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the difference there, the toll it takes on you mentally, physically, emotionally, um, it, you're probably going to choose the easier route, right? So when we do see nurses in these homes, one thing that, that the family said, but also Disability Rights New Mexico said is, you know, you know that they want to be there and that they would be nowhere else. Sure, they should be paid better, right? Which I think is what the families are saying. There should be a policy change here, a shift there, which is also why they're saying that you can't just write this off as, as a symptom of yeah. the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, it really, I guess it begs the question uh, whether or not enough has been done to address the shortage or whether or not there's just, it's just an easy sort of blame it on this particular thing. And, and I should point out um, from speaking with the Medicaid director, which again, not their job, she pointed out, this is the insurance company's job to be finding these providers and making sure that they are in these homes. But um, we do know that the state is efforting a lot of different, um, th th there are several different efforts to try to get more nurses right here in New Mexico and to keep them here in New Mexico. There were tax incentives and um, there was just a 15% raise as well um, for nurses that happened over the summer. That's a result of federal money coming in. One thing I also thought was interesting, they are partnering with UNM to create this pediatric simulation lab, which will train nurses to learn um, specific skills that will be used in homes yeah, that in that home setting. setting. Yeah. Yes. So that's in the works. That's another effort. So they are paying attention, it seems. It's just not quick enough mm -hmm. for these families who have already been dealing with this lack of service for years now. Yeah, and of course, the lawsuit here that's been filed, um, essentially alleging that, you know, there's a problem here that needs to be solved through the court system, that it's not getting enough attention. Um, I wanted to ask you, what is the status of that lawsuit right now? I know it was filed in the federal court system, is it going anywhere? Is it just sort of waiting for each side to come up with their arguments? And uh, what's the next step? Yeah, there's been a lot of back and forth looking at the federal docket for this case. Of course, this is a serious one. They're uh, alleging federal violations, federal rights violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Patient Protection Act, just to name two of them. Um, as of right now, it's still in the courts. The last thing I saw on the docket was that they're trying to schedule dispositions. From speaking with the Disability Rights New Mexico attorney, she is asking for a, like, let's speed this up because mm -hmm. these are children's lives um, that are at stake. And, and one thing she mentioned, which was, I, I think, tough to hear, is that you know, some of these kids could lose their lives waiting for this court case to play out yeah. because it could take years. So, wow. The people who you tried to speak with in this um, situation, I know that um, you essentially said that HSD wasn't going to comment. Um, but I was just curious, you know, did you receive any other statement about the issue? Sometimes more broadly, uh, these companies will try to address the allegations without uh, directly addressing them. But was it just a straight up no comment or was there anything more that came from you reaching out to HSD? No, HSD, I, I spoke with the Medicaid director, as right. I mentioned, and we spoke more generally. Um, I was able to ask her about the relationship with the three insurance companies, because how this works is um, the Human Services Department pays the um, Medicaid dollars to the insurance companies. The insurance companies find the nurses, pay the nurses with that money. So the allegation here being that because these insurance companies are not finding the nurses, 
they're pocketing those that that Medicaid money mm -hmm. instead. So what the Medicaid director shared with me, New Mexico's Medicaid director shared with me, is that they have um, a close eye, the state does, on these three insurance companies. They cap their profit at 3%, which is something that they evaluate at the end of the year to make sure that that money is going to the Medicaid members, not to salaries. So that's looked at at the end of the year. If it's more than 3%, they do take those dollars back. So I am told that, you know, they do pay close attention. Um, and yeah, it's, you never want Medicaid fraud, right? You always have to pay attention to those sorts of things. So this has been um, quite the feat, but of course, couldn't comment specifically on the lawsuit in the allegations against them. And I know in that lawsuit, you mentioned that there are some other families that are uh, a joint party to the lawsuit. Um, I wanted to just ask broadly, do you get a sense that there are more people affected by this issue than maybe who are members to the lawsuit? Yes. So there are three families, including the Cortez family that are involved in this lawsuit. Um, and just to explain there, so Amariz is receiving zero in home nursing hours. In the lawsuit, it says that um, there were two three-year-olds who were also listed as plaintiffs. The one is only missing five hours a week, but it's still a contract contractual obligation that's not being met. Mm. The other one, um, almost 100 hours that this child is supposed to be receiving that they're not. They're getting 76 a month when they should be getting 173 a month. Okay. Um, but there is an effort right now to Disability Rights New Mexico is hoping to make this a class action lawsuit. They did ask that we make that clear to our viewers. Um, if you know somebody or um, if, if you yourself have a medically fragile child who should be able to take advantage of this service and, and has not been, who has not been getting it, to reach out to them. I'm told that um, by the attorney, by Disability Rights New Mexico, they believe that there are about 400 medically fragile children here in New Mexico. Um, the state statistics show 250, and I believe that's about how many are currently on it. Mm. Um, okay. So I believe there are more families out there. Exactly. Who maybe not be part of that program. Compared to so. just the three. Yeah, um, and the one thing... You know, in speaking with the Cortezes, they weren't even aware that this waiver was available to them, which is another thing that mm. Disability Rights New Mexico was frustrated by, because maybe some families do have a, a child who would be considered medically fragile and has no idea that they have this option, and they might be suffering in silence right now. Um, you know, maybe mom quit her job and they're just living on one salary and they aren't aware, which is how the Cortezes were at first. Um, Alicia trusted us to tell us that she they almost lost their house as a result of, of not being able to pay for any of this until somebody just happened to say how oh, did you know that there's help available mm. so i wow. think that's something too that they're asking be changed um yeah. you know you, you can only imagine just not even getting um the knowledge that something like this exists yeah wow well, Anne, thanks for reporting this story. It is illuminating to me as well. Um, I had not heard of this program until seeing your reporting here. What's a good way people can get a hold of you if they have a question or an idea? Uh, you can always find me on Twitter or Facebook at Ann Perrette. Instagram as well, same thing. And my email is ann.perrette at krqe.com. Okay. Anne, thanks again for joining us here. Thanks for having me, Chris.